The words to which I'd like to direct your attention this morning are found in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground and rolled out, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he'd entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask that you use your word to deliver us from faithlessness and prayerlessness, which is death, and make us a people of faith and prayer, which is life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You'll remember a few weeks ago in Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, we saw the glory of the Mount of Transfiguration. And now we see the agonies of the valley. And Mark chapter 9 reminds us that as glorious as the mountaintop experience is, the normal occupation for the disciples is in the valley of service. And so while Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, the other disciples are down in the valley, continuing the work. But the disciples struggle to complete the work during Jesus' temporary absence. And this story centers on their inability to exercise a demon from a boy. Jesus, you might remember back in chapter 3 and chapter 6, Jesus had deputized the disciples to cast out demons. And in chapter 6, the, the disciples even had success casting out demons. But now in Mark chapter 9, with this demon, they cannot exercise the demon. And Mark provides an extensive description of the boy's horrific affliction. We're told that the boy is mute, He's racked by seizures that dash him to the ground, that cause him to foam at the mouth. He grinds his teeth, and he becomes as stiff as a board. And the disciples can't heal him. They are found wanting. And the resulting hubbub exposes their inadequacy and brings them public shame. And as we will see, the problem here is that the disciples get cocky. In other words, they assume that because they were deputized to cast out demons earlier, they assume that they can now just heal whenever they wish, however they wish. But that's not how it plays out in this story. And so Jesus comes down the mountain, and he receives the Father's complaint in verse 18. I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And then Jesus responds, verse 19, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? You see, Jesus' diagnosis of the problem is faithlessness. The disciples can't cast out the demon. What's the problem? Jesus' diagnosis, the problem, in verse 19, is faithlessness. There is a lack of faith 
first in the would-be healers, the disciples. But then in verse 23, the emphasis shifts to the father's lack of faith. And so there's faithlessness all around. And that's why there's so much difficulty with this healing, because faith is needed from those who perform the ministry and from those who receive the ministry. And as we see, Jesus goes on to heal the boy who is described as a corpse in verse 26, which raises the question, did the boy die? And it's not entirely clear, but it does seem that the boy died. Mark's description of the whole scene is this picture of resurrection. And there are similarities between this healing and the resurrection of Jairus' daughter back in Mark chapter 5. And then after the healing, Jesus withdraws to the house and instructs the disciples privately, as he does rather frequently. We've seen this and made note of this throughout the Gospel of Mark. We see this in chapter 4. We saw it in chapter 7 a couple of times. We see it here. We'll see it again in chapter 10 and in chapter 13. There's a big incident. Something happens. And then Jesus withdraws privately with the disciples to instruct him. And there is something here. Like, this does mean something. Jesus instructs them privately. And some years ago, it grew popular for small groups to meet and do their Bible study in public. And of course, this is perfectly acceptable. Uh, it's good for God's people to, for example, sing hymns in a pub or do a Bible study in a coffee shop. That's good. And it's not good because it's evangelistic. It's usually the opposite. That's not why that's good. It's good because it helps build courage. It's good because it trains us to uh, not keep our faith private. And we need some courage in this day and age to take our faith out of our house, out into the world. So those things are good. Yes, yeah, so let's do those things in public. But it's a passage like this that reminds us that there are still times when instruction needs to happen in private. And as Jesus is in private with the disciples instructing him, they review what happened. And Jesus tells them in verse 29, this kind, in other words, this kind of demon, cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So he says, this kind of demon. And that implies that demons can be put into different categories. That implies that some demons are more difficult than others. Some are more difficult to cast out than others, and the disciples can't cast out the difficult demon. Now, I want us to focus on two main lessons that this story teaches us. First, from this story, we learn that God uses prayer to faith. God uses prayer as the avenue to faith. Now, throughout the story, it seems clear enough that the disciples' impotence is tied to their... We saw in verse 19, Jesus' diagnosis was faithlessness. And then he turns his attention to the boy's father and says, you need to have faith. So the problem is clear. The problem is faithlessness. And so the entire story, from the disciples' failure to the father's doubting, emphasizes the necessity of faith. But then when the disciples ask Jesus why they can't cast out the demon, Jesus says in verse 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So wait, wait, wait. I thought the problem was faithlessness. Verse 19, you said, Jesus, the diagnosis is faithlessness. But now in verse 29, you're saying the problem is prayerlessness. Why are you changing your diagnosis? Th this is inconsistent. You said it was this. Now it's this. What's the problem? What's the why are you changing? And you have to realize that the diagnosis has not changed. The diagnosis of faithlessness in verse 19 and then the diagnosis of prayerlessness in verse 29 are the same diagnosis. And so we have to see the connection between faithlessness and prayerlessness. Or to put it in the positive, we need to see the connection between faith and prayer. And the connection first is that they're closely related. 
And it seems that prayer is the avenue to faith. So let's think about that. Why is prayer the avenue to faith? Okay, well, let's think through this. When we pray, what are we doing? When we pray, we take the matter to God. When we don't pray, we refuse to take the matter to God. When we don't pray, we have made the choice to keep God out of the matter. I don't need you on this one, God. I've got this covered. By not praying, we deal with the matter on our own. By not praying, we deal with the matter on a purely human level. And so prayer is an act of faith in the same way that refusing to pray is an act of unbelief. The lack of prayer is an unwillingness to depend on God. It's an unwillingness to take the matter to God. And so, knowing that connection, why did the disciples not cast out the demon? Well, it's faithlessness, verse 19, it's prayerlessness, verse 29, but the real issue here is that they tried to do it without God. They said, I've got it covered. You deputized me to cast out demons, so I'm good. I can go cast out any demon I want. And in the process, in that sort of bravado, they kept God out of the matter. They tried to do it without God. It's a case of lifting their eyes no higher than their ability, which is a big problem for people who have a lot of ability. And this is why I think Jesus is so frustrated in this story. He's more frustrated in this story than most. You see the frustration come out in verse 19, verse 23, and it kind of reminds me of when Jesus sighed deeply back in chapter 8, when the Pharisees demanded a sign, Jesus sighed at them. You know, so Jesus gets frustrated with people. He got frustrated with the Pharisees, but now he's frustrated with his own disciples. And he's frustrated because I think he's thinking, well, after all this time we've spent together, after all I've taught you, after all you've seen with your own eyes, you still don't realize that the only way to bring heaven to earth is through me. And it's not an exaggeration to say that Jesus is frustrated with their unbelief, as evidenced with the sharp words to the boy's father in verse 23. See, the disciples lose the sense that their power is through Jesus. They forgot to depend on Jesus' unique power. And so they think of themselves as the natural experts in exercising demons. And this is, this is what I mean earlier, I said the disciples get cocky. They were, they were given this commission to go and exercise demons from Jesus. And so they go out and now they're cocky and they think, no, Jesus told me I can do this, I've got it covered. And then they bracket out God from the entire operation. And when they fail, they are learning that there is no such thing as automatic power. And this is one of the things people of ability need to really think about. There's no such thing as automatic power. You can be commissioned by Jesus himself to do the task and still fail if you leave Jesus out of the picture. And at Trinity Reformed Church, this is a very unique congregation. There's lots of gifts and abilities here beyond what I've seen in a church before. And so we need to understand that just because God gave you that talent, just because God gave you that ability, just because you're so well read, just because you have so much knowledge, doesn't mean that you now have automatic power in ministry. You don't need to rely too much on that ability or on that talent or on that knowledge. You need to rely on the Lord himself. Our power is always rooted in God. It doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter how much experience you have. We must always remember that our power comes from God and God alone. And I think it's the people of ability, the people of spiritual giftedness especially, that need to be reminded of that fact. And so what did the disciples do rather than pray? Well, if you look at verses 14 through 16, it seems they're arguing with the crowd. They're too busy arguing with the crowd to pray. And my hope is for the congregation of Trinity Reformed Church that we would not be too busy arguing with the crowd 
to the point where we forget to pray. There may come a point where we need to argue with the crowd. I'd argue we're at that point. So go argue with the crowd. The problem isn't arguing with the crowd. The problem, and I do think we have a particular susceptibility to this problem in this congregation. The problem is when we start arguing with the crowd to the degree that we forget to pray, that's a problem. That was the problem here with the disciples. So be warned. Don't argue with the crowd to the extent that you're not praying. That's a problem. And so the disciples don't pray because they're arguing with the crowd. And interestingly, Jesus, as he steps in and eventually heals the boy, Jesus does not offer up a prayer to exercise the demon. He says it's faithlessness, it's prayerlessness, that's why you couldn't do it. So you would expect then Jesus to have some sort of wonderful prayer to exercise the demon. But there is no such prayer recorded in this story. Which means, I think, that the prayer that Jesus has in mind is not some set of magical words. It's not just some, hey, just rotely say this thing. It, it, the problem is prayerlessness. So the kind of, of life you need to live, the kind of way you solve this problem is to live a prayerful life. It's the sort of prayer that's constantly depending on God for your every movement. And so the disciples were not depending on Jesus like they should. And then that's why in verse 25, as Jesus steps in, heals the boy, Jesus says the emphatic, I command. Jesus addresses the demon. He describes the nature of the demon. He says, you mute in deaf spirit, I command you. And that teaches us that when you're dealing with demonic things, you should describe the nature of the demonic thing. Say it for what it is. You're mute and deaf. Okay, let's say it. You're mute and deaf. Let's call it what it is. And Jesus is basically saying here, hey, listen up, you mute and deaf spirit. The disciples couldn't heal you, but I'm here now. And I am now issuing this command as the Son of God. You might have been able to limit the authority of the disciples by distracting them with a crowd that likes to argue. They kept it on a purely human level, so you're still in the boy, but I'm here now and I command you, mute and deaf spirit, get out of the boy. And the demon, as we see, met his match. And we need to see that our work, whenever it's done without the power of God, can be resisted. You might have all the right arguments. You might have all the right syllogisms. You might have all the right knowledge. You might have it all. All the right gifts. All the right talents. But when you do your work, when you do your ministry, when you do your parenting, when you go to work, when you do these things without the power of God, the work of God through you can be resisted no matter how gifted you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter your calling. A lot of Christians get confused on this. They say, no, God's called me to this, so I'm going to have success. No, you're not going to have success if you don't depend on the Lord. And it doesn't matter your experience either. This is the other problem. As Christians get older, they have all these experiences, and they think, yeah, yeah, I've done this 20 times, and it went well 20 times. I'm just, I don't need to really prepare for this. I don't need to really pray about this. I can just go into this situation and just do it on autopilot because I've done it so many times. I've got this. Well, what are you doing? You're doing the same thing the disciples did. The disciples said, I've got this. I was commissioned to cast out demons. I've had success before, so I can just do it. I'm on autopilot, and I don't need to rely on the Lord. And so we need to see in this passage that it doesn't matter how gifted or talented or experienced you are. You must always rely on the Lord. And if you don't, your talents can be resisted. Your gifts can be resisted. Your experience in ministry can be resisted. You must rely on the Lord. How? How do you rely on the Lord? Well, if you don't know the answer, then you haven't been listening. You rely on the Lord by praying. There is a very tangible thing that you do every day to rely on the Lord. It's praying. This is what you must do to rely on the Lord. If you do not pray, you are not relying on the Lord. If you do pray, you are relying on the Lord. Look at Jesus' words in verse 23. He says, talking out of the boy's father, all things are possible for one who believes. And see, this is the prayer of faith. It's the prayer of faith. When you pray, you believe. 
When you don't pray, you don't believe. It's the prayer of faith that James references in James chapter 1. Prayer is faith, in other words. And the faithful person will pray. All things are possible for one who believes. Now that does not mean that faith can accomplish anything. It means that those who have faith will set no limits to the power of God. And so, you say you want your life to have more power. You say you don't want to be one of those people that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, who have the appearance of godliness but deny its power. You say you want your Christian faith to have substance, not like those other evangelicals. I want my faith to have substance. You say you want to be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. You say you want to have the wisdom to answer a fool according to his folly. You say you want the respect of your peers. You say you want your life to be above reproach. You say you want to resist sin's temptations. Well then, listen carefully. You must depend entirely upon God. And the way to do that is to pray. You must make prayer a priority. You're not too talented to pray. You're not too smart to pray. You're not too knowledgeable to pray. You must always pray. You must make prayer a priority. And when you do, remember what we've learned in this story. Praying is not about summoning up a mighty faith. Prayer is the act of faith. When you pray, you're exercising faith. When you don't pray, you're exercising unbelief. That's why you must pray. Prayer is the tangible way you trust that God will act decisively. And so, many here in our congregation want the faith to move mountains. This is why I love it here. We have mountain movers in our midst. There's more mountain movers in this congregation than I've ever seen. We have people who want to move mountains. And we as the session of Trinity Reformed Church want to move mountains. We're a bunch of mountain movers ourselves. Okay, we want to move mountains, you want to move mountains. Here's what you must remember. You want to do that great thing? You must pray. Do not do that great thing without prayer. You must pray. And so the first thing we learn from this story is that God uses prayer as the avenue to faith. And the second thing we learn in this story is that God overcomes doubt. You know, one of the most oft-quoted passages in the Bible is in this story. It's Mark chapter 9, verse 24. I believe, help my unbelief probably been prayed more often than even the Lord's Prayer. I believe, help my unbelief. So the boy's father affirms two things. First, he believes. Second, he doesn't believe. And what's interesting, though, is those two things sit together not as an inconsistency. He says these two things, and it's entirely consistent. There seems to be no contradiction between the father's affirmation of faith and then his admission of unbelief. And there's much that we can learn from this. First, we learn that both faith and doubt are the frequent experience of disciples. Second, we learn that faith and doubt mixed is no obstacle to Jesus healing the boy. And third, and this is what we need to put our attention on this morning, there is a difference between doubt and denial. There is a difference between doubt and denial. And Alex Ryrie, the historian, has written a lot about this. You know, Christians commonly assume doubt is a bad 
thing. And this goes back in the history of the church. In the 13th century, the Roman Catholic Church canon law said that someone who doubts is an infidel, which is pretty strong language for them in those medieval times. You know, doubting Thomas has never been a compliment in the church. But we must distinguish between deniers and doubters. Deniers have earned God's judgment. Doubters deserve sympathy. Doubt, in many cases, many cases, is a temptation, but not a sin. When God permits the devil to tempt his people, he does so for a reason. Temptation is not simply a meaningless attack to be repulsed. Temptation is trial by combat. Temptation is a training arena from which the victor emerges stronger. The temptation to doubt is an opportunity to grow stronger and does not necessarily lead to sin. And so when the boy's father says, I believe, help my unbelief, he implies that faith and doubt are not necessarily alternatives, but they can be companions. In the course of a Christian's life, faith and doubt will inevitably be intertwined. And to admit this is to say nothing other than the fact that Christian faith is imperfect. You can ask the most seasoned veteran Christian you know, and he will tell you, or she will tell you, yes, that's right, faith in this life, in this world, is imperfect. Which is to say that Christian faith can be weak, and Christian faith can be incomplete. William Perkins, the eminent Puritan pastor, said, True faith, being imperfect, is always accompanied with doubting, more or less. Richard Hooker, another Puritan pastor, said, Faith, when it's at its strongest, is but weak, yet when it's at the weakest, it is strong. And we see this principle over and over again in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 43, That which is sown in weakness is raised in power. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, God tells Paul, My power is made perfect in weakness. Hebrews 11.34, we're told that the Old Testament saints, saints were made strong out of weakness. So why is this the case? Why is God's power perfect in your weakness? Well, it's because when you are most aware of the weakness of your faith, then you are most likely to throw yourself entirely on God for help. And one of the things we need to understand is that there is a way to be faithful in weakness, even as you are weak in faith. You can be faithful in your weakness. And this, I think, is a mind-blowing thought to most modern American evangelicals, because for them, if they're on the highway of righteousness, any weakness is an automatic off-ramp down into sin. And so, if there's a moral weakness, ah, well, I couldn't help that sin. You know, I, I couldn't help it. It's not really my fault. Or if maybe there's a historical weakness, maybe there's a certain history for that person that then leads them to a certain path of sin. They say, well, you know, it's not really my fault. I've got this history. Or maybe it's a personality weakness. Ah, this sin's not really my fault. It's kind of a personality thing. You know, I, took, I took a test. And so you have to realize that that's not true. Yes, you might be susceptible to a particular moral weakness. You might be susceptible because of your particular history, and you might be susceptible because of a particular personality flaw. But there is a way to be faithful with your weakness. Weakness is the temptation. It's not necessarily the sin. And so in this case, the weakness is doubt. The disciples' weakness here is doubt. And so doubt, you have to understand, is a weakness. Doubt doesn't necessarily mean apostasy. Doubt might just mean you're living. How so? Well, in the same way, if you don't feel any pain, you must already be dead. In the same way that if you don't feel vertigo, when you look down, you must be at the bottom of the pit 
See, God has a purpose in your weakness. God has purpose in your doubting. And so think of it like this. The tree benefits from the strong winds blowing its branches back and forth. This strengthens the roots. Shaking cells and roots the tree. And likewise, doubt purifies those who pass through it and makes them stronger. Stronger where it counts, in the roots. See, this is how perseverance happens. You grow strong roots. The great Edinburgh preacher in the 17th century, Robert Bruce, taught his congregation that they should not flee from doubt. He said, you should set your feet and grapple with it. And this is the difference between them and us. We see weakness, we see doubt off ramp into sin. I couldn't help it. No, the great Robert Bruce says, no, when you see that weakness coming, when you see that doubt coming, set your feet and grapple with it. Don't let it win. You've got the power of the Spirit living in you. Your Christ conquered sin and death, and through faith you are united to His victory, not in an abstract way, in a very real way. And the real way plays itself out because He has then given you the Helper, the Holy Spirit, which is living in you, which empowers you. This is the power of Christ in you. When you set your feet and grapple with it, you do so in the power of the Spirit. And to be clear on what I'm saying, and, and what these Puritans who I've mentioned are saying on the issue, the point isn't that you need to go seek out doubts. That's not the point. The point isn't that you know, the more one doubts, the more virtuous they become. No, that's, that's not it. The assumption is that you will doubt. Much like the sick boy's father doubted. And since doubt is inevitable, we ought not to ignore it, we ought not to suppress it, and we ought not use it as an automatic off-ramp into sin. I couldn't help it. We need to lean into these weaknesses. We need to lean into these doubts in the hope and expectation that our Heavenly Father will use these doubts as the road to a firmer, more mature faith. Now, we also have to admit that for some it does not work this way. Some people's doubt leads to a strengthened faith, but other people doubt and their faith is weakened. Sometimes a soldier is tougher for being battle-hardened. Sometimes a soldier is weaker for being wounded. And so in conclusion, that's why we need to reflect on the way God uses doubt to sanctify us. And this he does in a way that leaves those who persevere stronger in the end. Let's close by praying together. Heavenly Father, we see how you healed the boy who was like a corpse. And we know that this is a preview of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus did what we can never do for ourselves. He died to pay the penalty for our sin, and he was raised in triumph over it. Forgive us when we rely on our own ability rather than your resurrection power. Through Christ's death and resurrection, you clear the guilty and establish that eternal pattern that weakness leads to triumph, that death leads to life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.